by us on behalf of the energy program here, uh, as well as the Sumitro Chair for Southeast Asia Studies. I'd like to welcome you to this, which is the inaugural session uh, of the US-Australia Speaker Series. Um, this is a series we're really pleased to present. Uh, it will focus on a whole host of issues that are really important to the deep and abiding and growing relationship between US and Australia, including issues of investment, trade, uh, security, and other issues. Um, Throughout the series, we hope to focus on a wide range of perspectives coming from the private sector, the government, civil society. Uh, and we know that there's uh, a great interest in this topic uh, throughout Washington and, and in addition to our viewers around the world. So we're really excited uh, and pleased to be able to kick off this series. Um, this speaker series is made possible through a partnership between CSIS and BHP Billiton. Uh, as many of you know, one of the world's largest uh, resource, uh, global resource companies. Uh, we're very pleased and privileged today to have Andrew McKenzie, the CEO of BHP Billiton, here to talk about some of his views on a series uh, and kick off this series in, in a proper fashion. So, Andrew, thanks so much for being here. You're welcome. Uh, I'm going to kick it off to or hand it over to Frank Ferrastro, who is the uh, Senior Vice President here and Schlesinger Chair for Energy and Geopolitics uh, at CSIS. Thanks, sir. I think I'm okay. Thank you. Okay, so let me add my welcome to Sarah's. Um, as a senior VP here, it's uh, our pleasure to uh, welcome Andrew. I had the pleasure of actually seeing Andrew down in Houston uh, during Sarah Week um, and found both his remarks uh, insightful, but he's also the perfect person to kick off this US-Australia speaker series because he not only is the company, and I think the Wall Street Journal has described BHP Bulletin as the mining titan, but they're actually more than that. And on a personal level, the stuff that he has done in terms of organizing this, it's really a more diversified conglomerate now. Um, they do oil, natural gas, coal, uh, uranium, metals and materials that are supplied for both infrastructure and for renewable energy. Uh, as a mining company, they may be on the forefront of doing uh, work on CCS for climate change. So this whole notion, especially in this town, when we look for energy companies that have the full portfolio and certainly look at energy from every aspect. I would say the BHP Bulletin, Billiton certainly uh, equals that uh, description. Um, they are an all of, all of the above company. Um, Andrew himself, and it's a pleasure to have him here as our keynote speaker, but Andrew is a geologist and a geochemist, so near and dear to my heart. He holds his PhD in chemistry from the University of Bristol. He's published over 50 research papers as a scientist, which is unusual for a CEO. As a businessman, he joined BP's research division in 1983. He moved his way up into finance and capital markets and later into petrochemicals. In 2004, Dr. McKenzie joined Rio Tinto as chief executive of the Industrial Minerals Group. In 2007, he joined BHP as chief executive of Non-Ferrous. And in May of last year, he was selected as the CEO of BHP Billiton. He speaks five languages, and in his spare time, he currently serves as the chair of the B20, and we're gonna ask a little bit about that. And one of the reasons he's in Washington is yesterday he co-chaired the second meeting of the Business 20 Roundtable. We've asked Andrew to offer some prepared remarks to start us off, and then we're gonna settle in for a more relaxed Q&A, and then we wanna open it up to questions from the audience, and that's why we're all glad you've come. So ladies and gentlemen, please uh, join me in welcoming Andrew Billet. Andrew McKenzie. Well, welcome, and thank you, Frank. Um, yeah, I mean, as Frank said, I, I, I did give a speech earlier in the week, and I'm going to cover some of the similar themes uh, when I, which I covered in a perhaps more detailed way with uh, energy specialists down at CERA. But Washington plays a key role. It shapes global policy and influences the world's economic development. So I'm absolutely delighted to be here to launch this US-Australia speaker series with CIS, uh, which we consider a preeminent thought leader uh, on geopolitical trends important to both nations, I would say, important to the world. You know, as Frank said, uh, we are the world's largest diversified resources company. Our portfolio, as he covered, is special. It spans. Uh, just to repeat, steel-making materials, metals generally, energy, and potash for fertilizing. Uh, we're the only company uh, that supplies all of oil, gas, coal, and uranium, as well as the metals that are critical for energy infrastructure and renewables. 
you know, I like to think that makes us uh, semi-objective in some of our choices about how the energy portfolio will evolve. Because many, of course, have called for a all of the above approach to energy. You know, in fact, uh, that was something that uh, I think President Obama mentioned in one of his more recent speeches. And our uniquely diversified portfolio delivers this. It gives us a powerful perspective on the influence of geology, technology, and trade on supply, and how demand changes when countries develop as their people secure better housing, better transport, and better food. And today, there's no better example of this than China. When Deng Xiaoping uh, launched the, his market-based reforms over 30 years ago now, he envisaged the industrialized and urbanized society that we see today in China. And certainly myself personally and, and many members of our team are regular visitors to China as our most important customer. It takes about 30% of our revenue. And this has caused investment-driven growth in demand for iron ore and metallurgical coal. Uh, which is required for steel, and it's the steel that they needed to build factories, apartment blocks, and infrastructure. And then co coal and natural gas, increasingly important as they generate electricity and consume more energy as they move towards a consumer society. And for us, very importantly, copper, which uh, you know, really has one use uh, primarily, and that's to transport electricity. So in, in the process, in the, certainly in the past 20 years, as uh, Deng Xiaoping's reforms got going, uh, this has lifted more than 650 million people in China alone out of poverty. And that's more than the population of Latin America. And most of you can do the math and know that's double the population here in the US. Globally, what's happened uh, in the last uh, um, 20 years is more than a billion people have been lifted out of poverty, but clearly two thirds of them in China alone, which is extraordinary progress and progress that we at BHP Billiton have been really privileged to support because the commodities that we, we, we supply unquestionably are critical as building blocks for modern societies. Energy is crucial, though, at all stages of economic development. And as developed economies like this one become more efficient, their demand is plateauing, in some cases even reversing. So the real area of growth in energy demand, and therefore for which supply is being increased, is in emerging economies. So people gain access to electricity and living standards improve as countries modernize. It's kind of interesting to, th to reflect that more than 100 years, way back in the past, since Edison built the first power station, a fifth of the, of the world's population still lack access to modern reliable energy. We hear a lot of talk about you know, switching between coal and gas and renewables and so on. But we still have over 700, me 700 million people in the world relying on burning wood or charcoal or coal to, uh, wood or charcoal uh, to keep their homes. And a lot of their time is actually just spent collecting that. But uh, you know, thankfully, this is changing. So in the next 20 years, we expect 1.7 billion people to gain access to electricity for the very first time. Um, a large percentage of the population in China now, and probably many of the other developing East Asian economies, are already connected to the grid. And this has unquestionably heralded in the development of their industry. It's, it's created a rise in incomes and further increased the demand for energy, as more people can buy consumer goods such as cars and fridges. The growth of the resources industry is fundamentally tied to the alleviation of poverty, abject poverty as well as to the further successful development of emerging economies. So demand for energy is likely to increase. Uh, we, we think by 30% in the next 20 years. My co-speaker when I was down at CERA, John Watson from Chevron, said it was 40%. So it's a big, it's a big deal. And uh, two thirds of this new demand is going to come from Asia and about half from China and India. But the fastest growth will be in Africa. And the way these regions meet their energy needs will significantly influence the commodity demand amounts and pattern, as well as the health and stability of the global economy. In practice, every nation will choose a different mix. And it's very important not to generalize, for example, the experiences here in the US. Because each nation has to balance affordability, security of supply, and public preferences to fill their demand. And by the way, you see similar variations even between US states. Uh, so, in the next few year, few, so in the next few decades, we believe, however, that fossil fuels will remain central to the energy mix. Their affordability 
and the scale of existing infrastructure make them extremely hard to replace. So while renewables may be a rapidly growing source of energy, which we absolutely encourage as we strive to reduce carbon, we will only really be able to rely on them when large-scale and cost-effective storage of energy is truly available. Nuclear, it does provide a low-carbon base load. And as you've heard, as a uranium producer, we are keen to encourage that as well. But post-Fukushima, it does face strong public resistance in many countries, which is likely to slow or even reverse its growth for some time. Maybe not forever, because many countries still have quite ambitious nuclear programs on their books, just kind of waiting to see how public opinion evolves. So as we look to 2030, we anticipate that 70%, uh, only down from 80% of the world's energy, will come from oil, gas, and coal. Gas, of course, is expected to see the strongest growth through its wider use in power and transportation. But I would say, as I said, Sarah, that I don't believe the shale gas revolution uh, that you've seen here is unlikely to go global quickly. Uh, despite what many uh, have claimed, we are unlikely to see gas replace coal elsewhere, anything like at the scale and pace that you've seen here in the US. Costs and security of supply that mean most places will favor the use of their local resources to meet their energy requirements. And the fastest growing Asian economies um, have much easier access to large uh, coal reserves than they have to cheap gas. Cost of generating electricity today from gas is more than double, often a lot more than that, than the cost of generating it from coal. And so coal will remain the region's primary source of affordable energy for some time and the basis of its energy security. Every form of energy relies on the resources that we extract from the earth, and whether that's oil, gas, coal, or uranium, or indeed the fertilizers that you need to promote the, the growth of biofuels and biomass, um, or even the copper, a uh, very important business for us that's used in wind and hydro turbines or to connect solar panels. A renewables future is extremely good for that business since it uses about seven times as much copper on average relative to uh, the traditional fossil fuel industries. Uh, that's where our, if you like, our objectiveness comes, I think, in from. Um, so, but however, as our understanding of the Earth crust improves, and it does, I'll talk in a moment about some of the big advances in my own base science of geology, we are getting better at securing the resources for the future and can remain extremely optimistic about that. Of course, in some commodities, we do face more complex geology, fuel decline, or even lower grades. But history shows we do substitute we do innovate and we do improve efficiency and overcome and meet those challenges. So take our experience in oil and gas. The era of easy oil came to the end in the 70s, you know, partly uh, exaggerated by the Arab uh, actions at that time. But fortunately, that was the time when an understanding of plate tectonics emerged. And uh, you know, for, for those of you who followed that science, that's what actually got me hooked on geology as a, as a, as a school student and why I chose to study it at university. Uh, I actually had the privilege later on in my research career in, in working with one of the, if you like, the core and, uh, identifiers, I'm not really you, you, you of, uh, of plate tectonics in, in some of my research, which was uh, very nice. But uh, carrying on, in the 80s, advances in drilling allowed us to move into deeper water. And in the 80s and 90s, 3D seismic technology, which always gets the credit, but also geochemistry, significantly improved exploration success. And over the, next, over the last decade, everybody has heard how the combination of pre-existing skills in horizontal drilling, and just as an aside, the first big long horizontal well was drilled at Witch Farm in the south coast of England while I was looking after technology at BP. And I remember those days in 1995 when we were trying to dr drill two miles uh, uh, horizontally under Pool Harbor so we could protect an area of natural beauty. Well, that combined with hydraulic fracturing that's been around since the 40s has actually enabled the shale gas revolution to occur. Uh, the energy historian and uh, a chair, if you like, of Sarah, and, and actually a good friend of mine, Dan Jergen, has noted that there have been at least five occasions when the world thought it would run out of oil. But in practice, continuous inv innovation has meant that world oil reserves have continued to keep pace with demand, and they've grown by around 30 billion barrels a year. So what's true for oil and gas, and that story often gets rehearsed, is actually true for almost every other commodity that we're in. 
So come back to copper, power lines, wind farms, and the devices that increasingly turn waste heat more efficiently into energy rely on copper. Copper is also an energy efficiency story. It's the best conducting metal you have. The quicker you can get your energy in the form of electrons in a copper wire, the more efficient you will be. Um, so it's critical. But despite average copper grades falling by about four to, from 4 to 1 percent over the last 100 years, production has increased 16-fold. So as I like to say on many occasions, energy security is a matter of governance, not geology. Uh, what's above ground usually matters a lot more than what's below. And that's why, right now, close to 90% of investment in resources, old and new, is still made in more developed countries which have more of the correct governance to allow those de uh, developments and investments to occur. So at BHP Billiton, we firmly believe that open market society and free trade in goods and services as w uh, and ideas create the right conditions for development. Shareholders, host nations, and consumers all benefit from the competition that follows between countries for investment and between companies for the privilege to invest. And if this occurs in more places, supply will become more diversified and the pace of innovation will quicken and quicken, as it is today, as we kind of connect more and more uh, uh, the big brain of, um, of mankind uh, of seven billion and increasing people working together, hopefully trading good services and ideas. Asia's continued development does depend, as you can imagine from my remarks, on its access to affordable energy and resources. With half of the world's population in the region and global growth depending on its progress, much is at stake. And the debate here in the US regarding energy exports, which is all over the newspapers again today, I believe is very important. I, I, I kind of don't want to uh, count my chickens, but uh, I, my sense is that even before some of the new spice added by what's happening in Ukraine, the argument has more or less been won that exports of, of gas is the right thing to do. But still I fear some have argued and continue to argue that the US should not export gas and that exports will lead to much higher prices for domestic consumers. Uh, curiously to, to us, they use the difference between Australian and US gas prices in some cases to substantiate their claims. Well, I can tell you as a very large consumer of gas, the largest consumer of gas in Western Australia, through all of our operations there, as well as being a major gas producer, uh, perhaps what's not known is that we are a very major oil and gas company worldwide. You know, we're the biggest foreign investor, uh, a very large investor on any scale in US shale, and we have a huge operation in the Gulf of Mexico, but we also have big exposures to LNG in Australia. Well, that kind of perspective means that we know the price difference due to the, is, is not down to exports. It's simply due to the higher costs of offshore production in Australia compared to shale costs in the United States, not exports. So I would put it to you, a, an extremely open market and one that we stand very uh, uh, strongly alongside our government with. Um, uh, has enabled the development of Australia's reserves. It's made it one of the world's leading gas exporters and bolstered their, 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 own, their own economy. Exports, I put to you, can benefit both the US and its partners, and US cons customers will continue to enjoy, however, much lower gas prices than the nations that choose to import their gas. And the country will gain a lot more jobs at home. Frankly, the transportation costs and financing constraints and global competition will limit the volume of U.S. exports. However, these exports will help U.S. allies diversify their supply and, particularly important at this time, send a strong signal to the world on the importance of open markets and geopolitical stability. I, I believe, we believe very strongly that successful transition of the world's most populous nations into vibrant consumer economies both relies on and is crucial to geopolitical stability. US leadership, therefore, can encourage the development of a global market that supports this process, improves the resilience of supply, and advances free trade policy around the world. And over the long term, open markets will also help countries reduce their emissions, and very importantly, the next part of my talk, adapt to climate change. Diversifying the supply of resources and making technology more widely available will make it easier to switch fuels and become, and become more efficient. 
but more action is needed. We have to acknowledge, particularly as uh, producers of large amounts of fossil fuels, that unless we control emissions, the most likely energy mix that I've pointed to will have negative consequences for the broader environment. There's a lot of disputes about it, and many of those disputes uh, center on how accurate the forward forecasts of temperature changes or conditions in the oceans. Those predictions are incredibly fraught. <coughs> I used to spend a lot of time running reservoir models. You know, the range of these sorts of things, or climate models, as we, as we know, just looking six, years, six days forward in, at, at weather forecasts, are tough. And using discrepancies around these sort of things that I find is not entirely helpful to the debate of, uh, of, of what's really going on with the climate. You know, as a geologist, I like to go back to the geological record and, uh, and, and look what's going on there. And I'm not going to bore you with all the scientific details, but I am 100% convinced when you look at that substantial variation in CO2 and other greenhouse gases does result in temperature changes, which has potential and generally not good implications for life on Earth. Warming of the climate is real. This episode of warming is unquestionably down to human influence, and physical impacts are now unavoidable. But the solutions that we must choose must address both the issues of energy poverty, I've already spoken to you about, and climate change. You can't solve one uh, without the other. Uh, almost certainly, if you do that, then either objective is destined to fail because the world will continue to rely on fossil fuels over the longer term. Their continued growth in supply is vital and is critical to drive the economic growth I've spoken about and, probably even more important, the huge environmental benefit which will come from huge reductions in abject poverty. But also, we need it to increase all our living standards. As an industry, we have to work with government and other shareholders to pursue long-term solutions to reduce emissions uh, that actually have a lasting impact. As, as Jim Yong Kim, president of the World Bank, said recently, we have to focus on the good that we can do now. We should be confident about the future. And in, in, in relation to this, uh, uh, while resources security offers so much opportunity for many, there still is out there the risk that corruption, real and perceived, can stifle this kind of opportunity. So for us too, reservoir trans sorry, revenue transparency is important. BHP Billiton was a founding member of the extractive, still is by the way, Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative. And we are pleased that Transparency and International recently recognized our efforts and ranked us third uh, in transparency uh, across companies around the world. Transparency, we would say, unquestionably is good for business. It's good for shareholders, it's good for communities and the communities in which we operate. So, with innovation, good governance, and open markets, we can supply the resources the world needs, deliver returns to our owners, address energy poverty, and improve the world's ability to solve complex global issues like climate change. Clearly, I feel the circle can be squared. Resource security for the planet and its people, compatible with environmental responsibility, is achievable, and that's a prize worth having. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent, Andrew. Uh, not surprisingly, thank you so much for a content-rich um, presentation. Um, there's a number of avenues we can go down. Um, and for the day traders in the room, I think they walk away with uh, copper futures mm. as, a, as a primary takeaway. Um, I want to start with your role as CEO. So you've been in, in the CEO role now for a little less than a year. You're credited with focusing the company back on the four kind of core areas, but still needing to maintain a, a global strategy. And you've got a long history of bringing, bringing projects in like on time and under budget, which is so critical. How do you select with the diversity, with the changing landscape going on in the world and rising costs, how do you select where you want to put your assets and the finances to back them up? Well, um, you know, we, you talk about the four pillars that we concentrate on. I mean, I mean, our company, uh, you know, it was, a, it was an old adage from management advice back in the 80s that you should stick to your knitting. And in our case, our knitting is petroleum engineering, mining engineering, and geology. Okay. And we need to find things where those skills will give us the maximum return to our shareholder. Uh, we've been very conscious, you know, that, that, that the patterns of demand are shifting. 
the bulk of our profitability in the recent past has come from making things that get, get turned into steel uh, by others. But we see that shifting, particularly driven by China, as it, it, it kind of starts to slow its infrastructure mm -hmm. building phase and moves so far so good into something based more on consumption. And that's why I spent more of my talk talking on energy, right. because as we go forward, the bulk of our investments are likely to be concentrated on increasing our ability to supply energy, particularly uh, to Asia. But very long term, we do think that a hopefully stabilizing world population will want to eat better and will want to run its agriculture better right. and be more efficient. And that will lead us to use opportunities on our skill set to work on, 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 uh, on fertilizers and things like potash. But I have to say, you, you address the day traders, I'd address our investors, they know full well that although we create the options, the selection of projects that go forward okay. are, are, are exclusively based on a competition based on returns mm -hmm. and the net present value that we can add to create the, the highest level yeah. um, portfolio that we can. And some of the things you've done that you referred to, the focus on the four pillars has already led, in, in my view, to big savings in costs. So we've announced that we've cut our unit cost by five and a half billion dollars in, in, in a two-year period as a result of that focus and a big increase in capital efficiency. So even though we're cutting our capital by about 25%, by promoting higher returns, uh, we, we, we believe that we can actually add as much volume or value right. from, from, say, about 16 or $15 billion of capital that previously took over 20. Excellent. So one of the focus, or one of the primary reasons that we put together this speaker series is to be able to draw the fact that Australia and the U.S. different perspectives on the world. And Ernie tells us all the time that it, from the Washington perspective, we actually really need to look at, at regionally what's going on. From the window that you see on China from Australia, how do you view developing Asia? What's changed over the last five years? Where's it going? Um, I mean, part of it, just, just, to, just to very quickly add, is that they are moving towards a consumption-driven economy. Um, and the sense that I have you know, is that there's strong alignment from top to bottom in the, in, in the country to do that. You know, I'm very fortunate to serve on a, a group of 13 CEOs, foreign CEOs who advise Li Keqiang, uh, the Prime Minister of China. And the way he lays things out and the way that things happen is actually quite inspiring, to be <laughs> honest. But the, the, what's perhaps more encouraging to us is that when we talk to the CEOs of state-owned enterprises who are our major customers, you know, in the, in the steel mills and, you know, and the copper mills of, of China, or we, uh, at high level in my case or at lower level, we find real strong alignment on this message. And, and, and they are now trying to use things like credit controls and so on to increase the efficiency of their industry. And they are desperately concerned about the environment and how they can restructure and improve the environment around things, and, and it's going to be tough, yeah. and it's going to be hard, you know, but I think we, 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 we have to be um, a little bit mindful of some of the lessons of history. I mean, I didn't, go, I didn't take the job in the end, but I remember flying in for a job interview in 1979 in LA, and I can tell you flying into LA in 79 is no different than being in Beijing, Beijing today. today. Exactly. Well, you've opened the door on the climate change mm -hmm. argument. So people would talk, and you addressed it in your remarks, about how you reconcile uh, coal production and climate change and energy poverty. Because these are all they're difficult problems to solve. But I love the fact that from a mining perspective and a geological perspective, you look at things like whether it's carbon capture and sequestration or developing new resources to, to get a more sustainable future. But in, in your own mind, what, company, what are the responsibilities of companies to, to both make a profit, but also uh, help the next generation? Yeah, so, um, yeah, I mean, f first of all, on, 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 on perhaps on coal, yeah. uh, you, know, I, you know, as I've, 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 I've hinted for many people, you know, it is the lowest cost source of, right. uh, of power and electricity. And that doesn't matter whether you live in China or you live in West Virginia. Every, in both places, they choose 95% of their generation to be made of coal. So, you know, uh, uh, so it's very important that we understand that local resources will be critical. I don't think the oil and sorry, the energy industry has been well served by trying to demonize one, verso, one version of um, en uh, fossil fuel energy versus the others. You know, and so whilst I do see in time the trend will be moving more towards gas. If we're going to do everything I said long term, it's going to require a lot of coal. 
But the, but, the, but the good news or challenging news is, as I say, with so much uh, electri electricity and power dependent on fossil fuels, there's an even greater obligation on the industry to do something directly about what they, can, uh, about what they might do. And there's two areas. I mean, one of them is clearly dealing with the emissions in our own operations. And, and we've reduced our intensity by 16%. We've invested $430 million in that process over the last five years. But I think, and that's a very full sale, 100% accountability, non-negotiable. Then we move into the 90% of the emissions that, to some extent, we affect by providing fossil fuels. Right. You know, and therefore, it's, it's a much more shared responsibility. But, but where we have the skills, uh, you know, we should be lending them more clearly. And therefore, I think it's important, given that the big challenge, in the same way that there's a huge challenge to store electricity to make renewables more viable, there's a huge challenge as to how you would have bulk storage of carbon if we're going to make carbon mm -hmm. capture and storage work. There's lots of good ideas there, and, and they're based in my core science, geology. I was chief reservoir engineer at BP, and we just should lend our thinking about yeah. that. Because if we can actually make real progress there and create large-scale opportunities to capture carbon underneath major power stations, it might mean that fossil fuels not only you know, can alleviate poverty and do things in an environmentally responsible way. Because I know the resources are there for another 100 or 200 years, they could be much longer in terms of their use of a fuel source. And we should work as one industry to do that, because even you have to take a bit more carbon out the, uh, you know, for a unit of energy out of coal burning than you do gas. They're all producing carbon. Right. And if we get a solution, it makes gas even better. So uh, I will draw you back into the policy debate since we are in Washington now. So this whole notion of being able to, to use multiple fuels and not pick the flavor of the day so that we discount coal or put it mm -hmm. aside, I mean, my first thought was that uh, going to see Secretary Moniz or Senator Manchin would be high on the list of things to do when you talk about coal. And when you, when you look at poverty around the world and whether it's for cooking or basic energy, that the role of coal needs to stay but needs to be improved, how do you sell that policy message to policymakers? Like, don't move so, like we have from nuclear, don't move away from that and then neglect it, lose the capability to try to bring that fuel back. Well, I think you start from the basis that, you know, we accept the mainstream science and we want to do something about, you know, the creation of energy that makes its impact, you know, uh, if you like, less negative towards the general okay. environment. And then you say, but there is no, there is no one, one solution. You need a, a raft of measures. It's great that we have a number of choices of fuels that we can select from as we see which makes the more progress in squaring the circle of poverty alleviation and environmental responsibility. But then in addition to that, you obviously need a range of technologies. You know, I've spoken about the ones that I think the resources industry can make the best contribution to, but there's others where other industries have to contribute. And then you need to think about a range of policy measures. And those policy measures, again, there isn't one solution, and it's particularly hard to think of one solution when we're not going to get a global solution quickly. You know, and, and part of it can be a little bit of government funding, R&D, or whatever. Okay. You know, we, we have some direct action in Australia. Part of it can be regulation. But I think it's hard to avoid that some form of appropriate carbon pricing policy or carbon pricing mechanism is in there. Because you know, that then will drive the incentives to make the right choices of fuels and to make the right choices of technology and to cause them to be developed in a way that would make me much more um, excited about progress. And I'd wrap all, all around of that free trade in, 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 in good yeah. services and ideas that creates the flow of possibility and means that we'll move forward more quickly, as well as growing quicker economically. Excellent. So we want to give the opportunity for you all to ask questions, too. I have two more that I need to, to have addressed immediately. And one is the resource, the super cycle. And you talked mm -hmm. a little bit about this in Houston. Can you explain what's going on and how we view the world differently now? Yeah, the, the super cycle was a once-off. Okay. Uh, and it was a, it was a once-off caused by the massive acceleration of China as a result of you know, Deng Xiaoping's reforms. It didn't really take off in terms of demand until the late 90s and then really accelerated Early through 2000s. the noughties. Uh, the resources industry was not well prepared for it. Right. The mining industry was a, better, a bit better prepared because it saw the steel demand coming through and so it moved a little quicker. But you know, right until about 2003, 2004, all companies were still, still forecasting $20 oil. 
Right. You know, that's how, that's how caught out they were. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, and we were probably not much better on the mining side in our, in our price forecast. That happened because the, you saw, particularly in steel, I mean, it's, the steel growth in China through that phase was at some points more than 20% per annum. And, and, and the industry, because China didn't actually have enough of its own domestic production, had not fully built the infrastructure and developed the mines and, 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 and the additional oil fields to cope with that demand. So the next thing that happened is that everybody ran around trying to build things very quickly, often quite inefficiently. Right. Money was definitely wasted. You know, not all companies perform well, despite very high prices, when you, it, 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 on behalf of their shareholders. But now we're in a different phase. China is moving through to more st stable growth. It's moving to more of a consumption phase. It's, you know, it's going to grow you know, at, you know, around you know, 6 7 8% for a while. And, and, and the metals intensity of that growth is going to be much lower. It's going to be more energy based. We've built all the infrastructure now. And so it's capable of being expandable, expanded rather than in big chunks, but in small increments. And so we can look to, with reasonable optimism, that supply will be able to be adjusted to demand without these kind of dislocations. And, uh, and as a consequence, we're looking at a period of probably flat to falling prices. Right. So companies like us have to you know, become more efficient, efficient or we're not going to hold on to our margins. And we've been so far successful, despite flat to falling prices, our return on capital is rising. And I think that's an agenda the whole industry will share as we go forward. I don't think when you look beyond China, there's another China waiting to happen. I'm a bit more optimistic than some about other Asia and so on. And sometimes we're very hard on India, which is still a long way behind. It's just not going to happen the way that China happened. And so, you know, it's lower prices, more on efficiency. Um, but I think in doing that, people will perhaps become a little bit more sanguine <laughs> about, about the resources picture because the right. high prices create and their fall off created a little bit of a strange response. So our investors were worried about superabundance and the fact that they weren't making enough money and, and everybody else worried about everything running out. Right. Whereas in fact, now we're more in the middle and, and we have a sense that there is enough resources to go around and we, we can actually use that to make good choices. And now it's timing and deliverability. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I can't let you escape without talking about the B20, the Business 20, which is one of the reasons that you're in Washington. So talk about your role in the Business 20. Yeah, well, I mean, those of you who know about G20, uh, I mean, there's a B20, there's, oh, actually there's an alphabet soup 20, but I I, you know, there's C20, L20, F20, and so on. I, I've, I've lost touch, but, uh, but I know about B20. And, uh, and, and B20 have chosen, as their way of um, putting their input to the G20 deliberations, they've chosen sort of four themes that they're going to run uh, global task forces of business leaders, all chaired by, by, by Australian CEOs. Uh, and I've been given the privilege of looking after trade, just so you're interested. The other, the other three are finance, of course, uh, because it's such a subject of G20, but also infrastructure and human capital. Um, you've seen the announcement from the finance ministers, which talked about trying to get more than an additional 2% of annual growth above what is currently forecast. And, and the reason they come to that is everyone is very worried about zero job growth. Right. That they pro and indeed, the things I've talked about, about the progress and productivity we have in our, com in our company, you know, is, is, is perfectly possible we can get the growth that is forecast without actually adding much to employment. So to get employment, you have to add a lot more. More growth. You know, it's, I mean, part of it is upskilling certain jobs but, and compensating for the digitization and automation of, 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 of lower skilled jobs. Uh, we think trade can make a big difference. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, its track record is strong. Um, there has been good uh, progress since 2008 and the moratorium on, on if you like, um, tariff restrictions and protectionism seems to have held. But the volume and the growth in world trade has slowed over the, over the recent past. Maybe not in the emerging economies as much as the developed economies. So it's, I'm more, a bit more optimistic that better things are happening. But, if we, but we believe if we have a, a few measures, there is a possibility by liberalizing trade, as we say, of adding another Germany to the world which is another 100 million, 50 to 100 million jobs and possibly as much as $5 trillion of, um, of aggregate GDP. Yeah. And, and we, we've picked on three things that we want to work on. This is really attacking non-tariff barriers to trade, you know, which is how hard it is to get through customs you know, and so on and so forth. One, and I said this in my speech, spending a lot more time and see what it takes to create a lot more trade in services. Mm -hmm. It's more than 50% of world GDP, but it's only about 10 to 20%. We don't have great data. On, on, on global trade. 
Uh, and the third area is while we like some of the multilateral or bilateral agreements that are happening, clearly keen to see you know, you know, the, the TPP happen and the TTIP happen as well. Um, and we're doing a lot of, our, our new government in Australia is doing a lot of bilaterals. They're on the whole good, but the problem is if you're, if you're already got a trading relationship with somebody who is then pulled into one of those agreements and you're not in it, right. it can actually it's create exclusive. complexity. Yeah. And so we'd like to see uh, the, you know, some way in which we can um, come down to some, some simple rules that make sure that those bilateral and multilateral agreements ultimately will coalesce and will raise the standards and the possibility of something like WTO. But G20 is not WTO. It's not got any right. great executive powers. So what we have to do is to take some of those things and break them down to individual actions that each country in G20 can commit to, even just one in a matrix of three by 20, that they say they're going to do something about before Turkey, and so that we can see measurable progress. Excellent. OK, so for questions from the audience, we actually have a few rules, ground rules here. Uh, one is that you identify self, yourself and your affiliation. Uh, probably wait for a microphone, since the group is a little bit larger. And then to the extent you can, pose your question in the form of a question, and that would be really helpful. So we're going to start over here. And I'll work my way back. Thank you. Um, Jeff Hopkins with the Center for Climate and Energy Solutions. Uh, given your, um, uh, I guess, uh, entry into all areas of energy, I was wondering, kind of a technological question, do you have an opinion on um, carbon capture and storage combined with enhanced oil recovery? Uh, any, any thoughts yeah, on that? I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a great way of proving it because basically you get the oil credits to pay for some of the development of the costs of the storage. Uh, but there is, there is no way that you're going to get the volume of storage through using EOR. And equally, I don't think you're going to find a practical way of storing if you depend on conventional oil and gas reservoirs, even if they're only filled with water. You have to find a way that any old rock underneath a power station can actually be a, a, a significant sink for CO2. And there are, there are a lot of ideas around that as how CO2 is very, very corrosive. It's a problem of pumping it, but it also means it actually etches the rock. And so it actually can create additional space. It can create ways that you can precipitate it as carbonate. And that's where we think, you know, we've pledged quite a bit of money to get that research going. It's not really going. Uh, but ultimately, it's great to prove things through EOR, but the long run solution has to work under a, a Chinese power station. Sarah. Andrew, thanks very much. Fantastic comments. One of the things I wanted to bring it back to was, you know, obviously one of the things we're trying to do here is talk a little bit about the, um, the importance of the U.S.-Australia relationship as well. And you gave some really helpful perspective on the issue of LNG exports and sort of Australia's perspective. Mm. I just wondered if you could talk a little bit more about what you see as being shared values or shared perspective from the two countries that is sort of, you know, an interesting thing for you as BHP, you know, hugely important company in Australia, huge investor here in the United States, global reach. What are some of those, you know, shared values that we could be talking about? In yeah. Transition? Well, I mean, the shared values are obviously the things I talked about, you know, clearly, you know, everything that goes with a, a modern West, a Western economy, you know, respect for the law, transparent processes and, you know, and a real spirit of entrepreneurism. You know, the oil and gas part of BHP Billiton got started because of uh, joint ventures between us and, and Exxon, now Exxon Mobil in the Bass Strait. And so, you know, so we, we've been strongly linked. I mean, th there are obviously very important differences between the two countries. I mean, in many ways, the resource endowment of Australia is comparable, perhaps even better than the United States. But the United States has great resources, as we know. You know, but, but, but actually, you know, more than 10 times the population. So the bulk of the U.S. resources will be used in the U.S. Even if you agree to export everything, which I think you should, by the way, because I'm, I'm obviously a free trader now. Uh, you know, and, and that's, the way that, that's the way that Australia handles things. But obviously, with such a small population, the vast bulk of its resources in, are exported. But that export flow whether it's gas to Japan or it's steel making materials to China and Korea, uh, you know, it's absolutely critical for geopolitical stability in, in the Circum Pacific. And, and, and many of the allies of Australia and the US are dependent on those flow of commodities out of Australia, much less so than they are of the, in, in the US. But that also will build manufacturing in those places. 
I think we have a lot to do together. Australia is a small nation. Sometimes it, 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 it is, it's talked about it, but not being a member of G20 uh, because of its relatively small economy. But I think the resource, if you look at it as a resource economy, absolutely needs to be in G20 and needs to be a fundamental player, in, 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 in particularly in APEC, which to some extent was kicked off by an Australian, Paul Keating. And I think we should continue to build on that. And obviously, in so many walks of life, Australia and, uh, and, and, the, and the US have been shoulder to shoulder, you know, both in peace and in, and in war. Middle right here. Hi, <clears throat> thanks for the comments. Uh, Jeff Epping with Energis LLC. In China, well, in the US, gas shales have obviously been very successful. China uh, has a good endowment for gas shales. How do you see that playing out in the next couple of decades? Do you think they'll be successful? That'll be a significant portion of their energy mix? I, 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 I think I would just sound a big note of caution, as I said in my speech about the shale gas uh, revolution, if you could call it, then here in the US going global quickly. Uh, and I make that point on, on, on a number of levels. I think this is new technology. The geological habitat of those hydrocarbons is not well understood. And until people have decent well tests, and they can show me, sorry, technical term here, the decline curves and the likely recovery uh, for, of, from individual wells, you know, I remain you know, a little bit skeptical at just looking at an in-place estimate and applying a, an average recovery. So first of all, we need to get, and I would say that to any nation who thinks they've got a shale gas environment, don't hype it, but do go and drill it and do proper tests, and then we can have a proper debate. Uh, but the next thing is, the reason it's gone so well in the US is not just because of its endowment and it's got access to technology, is that only for a very brief period, at the back end of the last decade, was there a question mark as to whether the US would be sufficient in low-cost gas, uh, self-sufficient. So it has an enormous industry based on gas, the distribution of it, chemical industry raising power from it, that is all up and firing. So as gas comes up, you can quickly back out coal and, and generate more gas. Most countries in the world haven't got that. You know, their history is using coal or they're less developed, so they don't have a distribution system. They don't have lots of gas-fired power stations waiting to be filled up you know, uh, and, and a gas-based and, and gas industry. And of course, they, don't have, they haven't evolved the regulatory uh, way of doing things and, and, and the laws that promote its development. And, and so I think when you talk about shale gas, particularly in terms of geopolitics, I would aim off quite a bit, even in China, for a, quite a few years. And you have to think as well about you know, the remaining power balance that exists within conventional gas, where again, sorry, I don't want, I'm not totally you know, wanting to be a champion for coal, but the availability of conventional gas is quite restricted in the world and more restricted than the availability in oil. As many of you know here, if gas spec existed, absent shale gas, it would be a much more concentrated set of countries in OPEC. So just staying on that topic, because I think that's really important. So we've gone almost whipsawed from the, the peak oil phase and totally running out to, in some ways, uh, uh, hyperbole and wildly optimistic assessments of how much, how long, all over the world at the same time. I, yeah. it, so you, I mean, you agree that we ought to rein some of the enthusiasm in until we, we see some results, right? I do. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't give up hope. No, 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 no. You know, I mean, I am optimistic. I mean, you know, sorry, I'm saying, but you know, when you drop organic matter into the earth, you know, it's thermodynamically, it wants to exist in two forms, carbon and methane coal and gas. Right. So there's bags of it around, and we know there's lots of coal that we can get after. I think extracting that more difficult gas, the right. tight gas, requires a lot of things to happen. Uh, and it won't always be low cost, you know, in which case people will have to turn right. to coal. So I'm very optimistic about supply. I just think the sense that the US uh, um, change, uh, as I said, will happen it's quickly, yeah. uh, you know, in, in a matter of 20 or 30 years, I think is, I think is on the optimistic side. Okay. Great. Jan, we'll, we'll keep the microphone there and then move back. <clears throat> I'm Jan Mayers with Resources for the Future. You commented about the potential desirability of putting a price on carbon as a way to reduce mm. broad emissions. Almost every economist in the world agrees that if we wanted to change the emissions of carbon, we should put a price on it. Your country did this for a while and is soon, I think, going to move away from that. Could you give us any insights, speculations as to what's required for a country to be willing to adopt a carbon price? 
Yeah, I can. I mean, and we've actually uh, supported the repeal of the carbon tax, as it's called in Australia, because it was a, it ultimately was a tax that was that was designed in a way that was actually uh, very injurious of uh, of Australia's competitiveness. And I think you have to balance how that tax, I don't really like how that price works, with, with with your own competitiveness, and not and not simply penalise local industry without without removing one molecule of CO2 going into the atmosphere. And the chances are that what would have happened there is the coal industry would have would have, would have invested less, and as a result of that, more coal would be developed elsewhere, possibly less efficient, uh, you know, uh, uh, in in many senses than the operations that would have existed in Australia. You've got to you've got to understand when you put it put something in on carbon, the, you know what does the impact of competitiveness of what other nations are doing, you know, and I think for a resources rich nation to, to to think it might prejudice its, its, its some of its most successful industries is a tough is a tough call. Um, I, I, we have to keep talking as much as possible to get global, but uh, but realistically we're we're not going to get there uh, easily, and we have to keep thinking carbon. Carbon price on its own is not going to get there. You need a raft of measures, you know, uh, and each country will probably have to do different things. Regulation, some, you know, some subsidies of R&D, making sure the energy mix is, is there, making sure you're developing the technology. But I do think it's something we have to keep, keep working on. Uh, and, 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 you know, ultimately an appropriate carbon pricing mechanism applied in many countries will, ultimately, I'm sure, speed the progress to finding a proper solution that squares the circle between poverty alleviation and environmental responsibility. Okay, in a democratic manner, we're gonna to move to this side of the room, little d Democrat, we're bipartisan, nonpartisan. Um, we'll start on this side. Hmm. Hi, Andrew, it's uh, John Keogh here from the Australian Financial Review. Thanks very much for a very good speech. Um, I just wanted to ask, does what happening in Ukraine at the moment bolster the case for the US to lift their export ban for energy? And, and second, uh, BHP seems to be expanding its presence and profile and trying to be more influential in the US. Could you just talk a little bit about the thinking behind the strategy on that? Um, okay, um, I'm, probably not, I'm going, probably not going to answer your questions directly. I think the case for US gas exports is already well made <laughs> without adding additional uh, cases for it. Um, I, and I think in terms of the US, you know, as I say, we are a very large investor in U.S. shale. Uh, uh, we're a big investor in the Gulf of Mexico. Outside of Australia, uh, it, it's, it's, it's our biggest uh, set of businesses. Number three is Chile. You know, it, you know, it seems appropriate that that because of that, that you know, that we and people like myself spend a bit of time here and a bit of time in other places to be part of the the debates we're having today. Okay, I'm going to take two more questions um, all the way in the back. And then we'll come back to this side. Yeah, uh, Bill Holland with Platts. I was at a, uh, I heard a talk by Australia's largest petrochemical manufacturer and dynamite maker. The name of the company escapes me, but. I think I knew. Uh, you probably <laughs> heard, then you're probably ready for what's coming next. He's convinced that the United States should limit uh, natural gas exports, that the, his, his experience as an Australian company is it destroyed his manufacturing uh, advantage because domestic prices tripled. And um, it's to the point where they're opening, their new plants are all opening in Louisiana, uh, not Australia. Uh, how would you respond to, the, to that? I think you may have already said it's a cost difference, not an import-export thing, but could you put some more detail on that? I, I, yeah, let's, look, he, I, he was very convinced that it was the wrong move. Well, well I mean, look, a, an economy like Australia has to balance you know, what's good for the whole economy, rather than select individual indus industries for what I might call sort of, uh, you know, select favoritism. And I leave that to, to the politicians to make those choices. You can't look at one industry in isolation from the, the vibrancy of the whole economy. Australia earns enormous amounts from exporting resources. You know, it is a fundamental industry for the country. I'm not saying it's enough to be diversified, but if it, if it violates the principles of free trade, and goes down the route of protectionism. It goes against everything I think that Australia has stood for in terms of resources. The issue in Australia with gas prices is, 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 is that you need to stimulate the supply. There's plenty of gas around in Australia. Uh, and it, if we stimulate the supply, then some of the concerns that are being voiced there you know, may, may be a bit easier to deal with. But ultimately, 
yeah, you're right. People are paying the market price for the gas, and I don't think you should interfere with that. OK. Do you have a question? So right-hand side, about the middle. Could you raise your hand? Thank you. Hi. Um, Sheldon Ray. I'm a portfolio manager at Morgan Stanley, and BHP is a sizable position in my portfolio, is full okay, disclosure. Well, See, um, I knew they were here. Oh, you mentioned <laughs> Africa briefly. Over the next five years, how would you see your overall revenue in Asia versus the continent of Africa and Middle East developing? Revenue, so sales to Africa. Uh, well, I, I don't have the, the detailed figures in my head, um, but uh, you know, Africa is, it, it, there's a lot of things happening in Africa, there's a lot of growth. But the bulk of the growth is, is, is already in the consumer base rather than in, in, in a lot of construction and infrastructure. So I think it will become slightly more important, but, but it will be completely overshadowed by what we supply to Asia. So typically when, when we get folks of uh, Andrew's caliber, part of the agreement is that we let them go in a time frame so that they can get on to other business and we try to carve out a section where we can get them to come to CSIS only if we release them on time. He has agreed to take a few questions from the press and we'll do a, a kind of press scrum um, immediately following this. But if the rest of you will join me in thanking Andrew McKenzie for joining us today. <laughs> Terrific opportunity. Nice job. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.